We are chatting with some industry heads from both aviation and rail um, to really get to the bottom of who has the best uh, value proposition when it comes to the A to B experience. Um, let me first introduce you to our, our first panelist for this discussion, uh, Mr. Tero Taskia. Um, Tero has worked as the CEO of uh, Estonian Air, um, CCO of Air Baltic, and VP at Gulf Air. Uh, he has a wealth of knowledge and experience in the airline industry um, and is very ideal to give us some insight into passenger experience. Uh, welcome, Tero. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Great to have you on board. Um, secondly, I would like to introduce uh, Jerry Angrave, who's the, um, the MD at Empathis. Um, Jerry has worked in different sectors, um, helping businesses improve their customer insights and experience. Uh, he's led customer experience programs at uh, places like, such as Lloyds Banking Group, um, and he has a unique uh, cross-industry insight um, into the rail aviation passenger experience. Um, so welcome along, Jerry. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Good morning. It's great to have you there. And um, finally, uh, we have Patrick Kombouf, um, who's the director for e-business at SBB Swiss Railways. Um, he's in charge of the de development and the subsequent execution of SBB's strategic e-business agenda in passenger traffic. Um, so he's very well versed to uh, give us some, some good insight today into the rail passenger experience. Um, okay, so let, let's start with the first question, uh, which is for Tero. Um, so Tero, uh, which elements uh, of customer service uh, do you think actually make air travel uh, you know, desirable to, to passengers when, when choosing their journey? Well, there are of course uh, many, but I would start from the um, uh, first part of the value chain, which is basically the, the booking. So the the booking tends to be easier for the uh, for the train, uh, oh sorry, for the air travel uh, compared to train, especially if you're booking from abroad. So uh, the distribution platforms, uh, which are easily available for tourists and for the businessmen, tend to exclude um, uh, train travel. Uh, also, uh, the speed is of course important. So. Uh, Many parts, and I would say most part of the Europe, the speed is still uh, faster with the air travel than it is with the uh, with the train. Even if you include the uh, uh, the airport experience, uh, going through the security and also traveling to the airport, then of course one could say that the the price is a customer service element, and the air travel tends to be um, uh, cheaper on on highly competed routes. Of course, it is more volatile. Than the, uh, uh, than the train travel. And then, of course, you have uh, elements of luxury, getting your feet off the ground. Uh, you have loyalty programs. You have a human touch on board. So, and that's, uh, that's a critical element. So even if the low-cost uh, airlines, they try to sell you something and you don't get free food or coffee anymore, but still there is a uh, customer interaction by the train staff, at the um, uh, in, inside the aircraft, and for some, that's actually an important element as well. Okay, fantastic. So you think there's more interaction there with um, uh, in, in the air, well, in the airplane, in the airport, than there will be for the the rail passenger journey. It's, it's interesting. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on this, Jerry, from from your perspective as um, you know, experience, customer experience um, sort of experts in, in this, this area? I think uh, Tara is absolutely right in terms of the um, the, the humanization of uh, of air travel is so important these days. Um, people, the, the bar of expectation is so high in terms of uh, people know they're good. To, you know, it's taken as right. I want to get from A to B safely, comfortably. So that's really not a, a differentiator. So the um, really acknowledging what it's like to be a passenger and what what's going through there. Uh, heads as they travel, as Tara said, through the different parts of the, the journey is, is critical. I think uh, it's an interesting one about what do we mean by customer service. Um, and I, I think uh, there's a lot to be gained from really understanding what that looks like to um, uh, from a, a, a customer's uh, perspective. Um, I was, did some uh, research recently and um, uh, for a regional airline and uh, Sorry, is, is, uh, is someone uh, trying to ask a question? Sorry. No, uh, I beg your pardon. Um, I, I did some research recently on um, uh, on what sort of things uh, passengers value the most. Um, and it was uh, the people who were um, advocating a, a certain airline were 
it was very much around the the the, the attitude of the staff and the, the cleanliness of the the cabin uh, the the aircraft cabin. People who were saying, "I never want to fly with this airline again." Uh, it was very much around uh, the lack of communication at a point when they needed it most. So when the when there was a schedule change or when there was a, a delay or or even cancellation, the lack of information at that point uh, was critical. And it was those experiences that really influence their choice next time. Um, so uh, back to Terry's point about, I think, yeah, absolutely, we, we, we need to recognize that whilst uh, we can use uh, uh, technology and um, processes and systems to improve the experience and improve our operational efficiencies, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that we're dealing with uh, real human beings, if that, may, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very, um, very interesting point, Jerry, you make. I mean, so the real time um, updates for the customer that that is helping enhance the experience, uh, and this is how uh, airlines can increase their uh, their customer experience and their loyalty. Um, from from what I've gathered, you you said there. Well, yeah, no, exactly. And um, just uh, as a very quick example, the um, if I'm travelling, I get a, a text message the day before to say, Mr. Angrove, you're flying from such and such an airport at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, wish you a happy flight. Please don't forget to turn up two hours before. So that's fine. What, what then happens is I turn up to the airport only to find that the flight has been cancelled and it's been cancelled for some time. But I, there's no text about that, um, and and then I'm left to fend for myself. And I, I and the the residual thought is thinking, well, how hard can it be? You can communicate with me when it suits you, but you're not when it probably doesn't suit you because you need me to come to the airport and spend money. And I understand all the, the commercial pressures behind that, but I think there are just ways of managing those experiences um, uh, just a, a little bit more um, effectively. Okay, okay, Thank, thanks for that, Jerry. And I mean, Patrick, what, what, what are your thoughts on this um, from a rail perspective? I pretty much like the last, the last episode he, <coughs> my colleague just mentioned. We, <coughs> we have a tendency both air and rail to uh, outsmart ourselves when it comes to execution. It's a brilliant idea to text message uh, the day before, but then when you don't have something like an event hub where uh, operations guys can hand in their schedule changes or delays or even uh, cancellations of flights or trains for that matter, uh, then it just is a nuisance and it creates even, uh, it backfires at the end as opposed to uh, creating a good customer experience. Generally speaking, I can say that I don't uh, see really the competition between rail and air as being the predominant fact today. It's more a co-opetition. Whereas in the four hour range of travel, uh, both air and rail are very competitive. When it goes beyond that, then I really see it as being they are complementing each other. And in many cases, <clears throat> where I come from in Switzerland, uh, an, air an air travel starts with the train travel because uh, parking fees at the airports are so prohibitively, prohibitively high that uh, it just doesn't make sense to go there by car. And walking is probably not advised with big luggage either. So uh, at the end of the day, you're going to take the train there. And there I think uh, it's good to engage both airlines and train operators to create the seamless and smooth customer experience right from the start. Where my, where my colleague uh, just mentioned earlier, uh, it starts with ticketing. So you should be able to have some sort of intermodal ticketing uh, hassle-free without go, go, going through uh, 12, 14 different booking systems and get your ticket within a, a few clicks. And that, I have to admit, uh, we are not fully there yet. OK, so you think, you think Patrick, that um, it's, it's not really about uh, you know, air competing with rail. It's maybe about the two uh, complementing each other. Pretty much. I mean, that's what we see being, being a small country in the middle of Europe, that uh, every, whenever it comes to the four-hour radius, uh, so any travel between uh, a, a Swiss metropolitan area to Paris, Frankfurt, Munich, Milano, uh, there there is a lot of market share 
to be shifted from airlines to rail because uh, with high speed relations uh, we are in beyond or even even on uh, under the four hour radius and with with uh, going to the airport security measures uh, frequent delays you are easy to beat that of rail travel by, by taking the train and uh, when it comes to uh, customer service on the ground I can s clearly see that there are a lot of efforts to be made to upgrade train stations to resemble uh, medium-sized airports of, na of nowadays so that the shopping experience, food and beverage experience and also some kind of meeting facilities you, you find there are more and more to the same standard. So there I, re I can really see that there is uh, less and less differentiation for travelers to be to be made between uh, rail travel and, and air travel. 